Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again for another wonderful session for 2021 Rhode Island Startup Week, our third year of doing this. Uh, really just a great day of events today. If, if you didn't catch the, uh, the calamari tank you just did, that was just amazing, far exceeded expectations. And there's a great slate of events this evening as well. Go to ristartupweek.com, take a look at the agenda, for today, for the rest of the week. Don't forget our startup showcases tomorrow in Providence, Friday in Newport. It's not too late. You can sign up for any of these and they're all recorded. So if you can't make it live, sign up. You can watch the recording at your own convenience. This is the Angel's Desk. Uh, I am really happy to introduce David Hemingway. David's a, a friend of mine. I've known him for quite some time. He's, uh, you know, on my LinkedIn page, I, I always say I'm the voice of common sense, but in reality, I think David should have that title. He really is the voice of common sense. Um, he is also one of the great gentlemen you'll meet in, uh, in business. He's the president of Persuades, a leader in sales strategy training and consulting. Uh, he's a consultant to large and small companies specializing in building partnerships and recruitment to accelerate growth. David is the author of Persuades Sales and Marketing Training for Entrepreneurs and Fundraisers. He's a member of the New York Angels, which, uh, David, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they're the largest angel group in the U.S. Um, David uh, we, we certainly lay claim to being one of the most active. We've already invested about $15 million this year. We have about 150 members, so we're certainly one of the largest, if not the largest. Yeah, I'll take that as largest for certain. Um, as part of the New York Angels, he has seen countless pitches, the good, the bad, and quite frankly, some of the really ugly. Uh as an advisor, he has helped on all stages of the startup world, particularly where sales and marketing can make the difference. Um, he holds seminars, what angels want to hear from uh, to fund your business, five ways to turn maybe to yes, tell your story and be convincing. Uh, and his Angels Nest podcast, which you should all go and subscribe to if you're thinking about fundraising, uh, provides a, a compact snapshot of a startup. It's traction with customers, and the long-term vision of its founders. Uh, it gives some great examples and, and lessons learned along the way for all of us in the entrepreneurial community. The Angel's Nest examines the company's value proposition as seen through the vision of early investors, advisors, and even customers. And I've probably missed more about David than I've already said. So, uh, you know, not gonna take the whole hour talking about David's accolades. I'm just gonna go ahead and thank David for being with us. Uh, and David, you know, from being one of the people on the other side of the pitch, we're all really interested in hearing what you have to say. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Terrific, thank you very much, Pat. It's really great to be here. Uh, I started my first company in Providence many, many years ago, and it turned out to be very successful. Uh, and it's probably something I couldn't have done in Boston or New York or in a lot of other places. Uh, so I, I think Providence is a great place to do business. Rhode Island's a great place to do business. Uh, even though I live uh, full time in New York, I still have a house in Rhode Island. We come back all the time. So I'm, I'm really excited to hopefully be helpful to entrepreneurs in Rhode Island who uh, want to get funded and, and want to get their start. It's great to see just how the startup community has grown here. It's just uh, absolutely amazing. So, so very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, angel investment and how that works. I, I've been a New York angel for 10 years. Uh, who, what kinds of people are angels, uh, and how can you construct your pitch to ma get maximum benefit? And uh, I think um, I have a little bit, of, a little bit of a hint at the end about how to avoid, you know, the huge crush. So because uh, there, there are a lot of people looking for investment. The good news is there's a lot of money around. So, so uh, Pat, how do I share my screen here? I just, oh, never mind. I just see it. Share screen. Sorry. Um, Okay. So, so Pat, am I safe in assuming that um, most folks here have not raised money or have raised a little bit of money? You think it's these are kind of first time folks who are thinking about raising for the first time? I think we have a mixed bag. We have a, a good number of people who are raising for the first time. We have some people who maybe have tried to raise or have raised for a current or a previous venture. Uh, we have some people who have raised for a previous venture and probably didn't do it optimally. 
and can mm-hmm. learn as they go for their next venture. So we're a little we're a little scattered in that. Okay, terrific. That just that helps me frame everything. So um, I would really like this to be as interactive as possible. That's difficult on Zoom, of course. Uh, but let's do this. Uh, put your questions in the chat, and Pat, maybe you would keep an eye on that for me. And if you see a relevant question come up, just feel free to interrupt. Absolutely. Okay, terrific. So first of all, who are angels? Uh, when I started my first company in, in Providence a long time ago, there were no angels. At least uh, there were none that I could find. And I looked a couple of times because uh, I had a great start out of the box. I had a company that did uh, traffic and weather and, and news reporting for radio and TV stations. And I came into town with a sponsor that then declared Chapter 11. So I was looking for sponsors and advertisers and all sorts of things very quickly. And I couldn't find very many. But now the angel ecosystem is just amazing. Uh, and I'll tell you what else has happened in the last year, year and a half. And you know this is a side benefit, I think, to COVID, which has not had very many benefits. But traditionally, angels wanted to drive to their investments. So uh, a New York angel you know, might not uh, come up to Rhode Island and look around for potential investments. But now with Zoom, uh, our sessions are dominated by countries, by, by companies not only all over the country, but all over the world. Uh, we, we saw one from Germany yesterday morning. So that means that even places like uh, Rhode Island and smaller cities can get access to investors all over the place. And, and I think that's really very, very positive. So, so to me, the best part of, of angels is right here. They often invest, but they also contribute in their areas of expertise. Uh, and that's very important. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later because it gives you an opportunity maybe to find a way into the angel world to uh, try to locate someone who's interested specifically in, in what you're interested in doing. Uh, the average angel investments between twenty five and fifty thousand dollars, but there are angels who invest five thousand dollars, and there are angels who invest one hundred thousand uh, dollars. One of the things that's happened now is that um, we have super angels, and we have uh, angel funds uh, who will invest hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um, that could really be all over the place. You're probably looking at this saying angels want a ten time return. Wow, that's crazy, right? That's a lot of money. That's that sounds greedy. But the truth is that many of our investments are going nowhere. Many of them are going to go out of business. And so in order to make the whole process work so that we can get a good average rate of return on our investments, uh, we need to look for a 10-time return. So when you're making your proposition to angels, think about that. Can they actually see where they can make 10 times their money here? Because if they can't, it's probably going to be a pretty hard sell. So even though I'm here to promote angel investment, and I believe in it, I've, I've been both a, an investor and an entrepreneur, uh, the first question you should ask yourself is, do I really need an angel investment? Uh, because sometimes there are other ways that you could get to where you need to go. You can bootstrap, you can find a partner, especially a channel partner, maybe who can feed you clients. Um, remember, any money that people put in means less equity for you, and ultimately also less control. Uh, you know, there's no way that folks are going to put money in your company without getting in your business. I mean, that's just the reality. Uh, and, you know, I'm laughing a little bit because Pat and I had an experience. He came through the New York Angels process, and we worked together in that. That's where we met originally. So this is going to be really handy because I can tell you what the angel investment process is like, and then Pat can tell you if I'm telling the truth. So we, we have both sides of the equation covered. Um, <laughs> you should also look around for what we call non-dilutive opportunities. So we are talking to a company now that is creating Google Maps for shipping. Uh, so it's, it's a platform that's going to show exactly where all the cargo ships are on the, in the ocean and uh, how soon they expect to be in port. And we're hoping that this is going to relieve a lot of the logistical problems you're hearing about in terms of getting you know, ships into port and getting, getting merchandise offloaded. So that company is a Canadian company, and they've received $5 million in grants. Grants means you don't pay it back. $5 million in grants from the government of Canada to develop this because the government definitely uh, desperately wants to free up some of the space at these ports. So, you know, it all depends on what you're doing and what the opportunities are, uh, but often there are opportunities to get grants. And, and uh, by the way, you won't upset angels if you get grants. Angels will love it when you get grants. That's non-dilutive funding. So these are people who are giving you money and they are, um, I'm just gonna admit Marty here, they are giving you money and they're not getting anything in return except uh, that they want you to develop this product conceivably for their own reasons, and that's fine. But you're not giving up any equity. You don't have to pay the money back. It's just a fabulous opportunity. 
So do you really need an angel investment? That's the first question to ask. And if the answer is yes, then you need to figure out, you know, what does that tree look like? What does that process look like? So usually we get an idea, and, and ideas are free, at least in the very beginning, until we start developing them. Uh, next thing that usually happens is there's a friends and family round, an investment of, of 250, maybe to $500,000, can be up to a million, uh, and it can be as small as 50 or 100,000, depends on what you need to develop uh, your minimum viable product. Uh, you need to develop something that will show future investors that you have got a product or service that actually has a market. That's really the key. So uh, angel groups can, can help you uh, in this angel investment area. By the way, I changed this this morning. The last time I did this talk, uh, I said that the average angel investment was at a two and a half, three million dollar valuation. It was maybe you know five to $600,000. Valuations are going up quickly. That's not great for angels. That is great for you. It means that the market is valuing what you do uh, more preciously than it has in the past. And you know, a lot of the reason for that is, frankly, there's just a lot of money around. The stock market's been going up for years. Uh, the, the, uh, there have been a lot of government support programs. Uh, people are feeling flush, and that's why there's uh, inflation at the grocery store, and it's made its way all the way to angel investments. So what do angel groups do? They aggregate investors. Uh, my group is 150 investors. You'll hear a little bit more about that later. We source deals because it's easier for you as founders rather than go to 150 different people. You go to one place and you can reach all 150. Uh, we perform due diligence and discovery sessions and we syndicate investments. So you might come to us looking for a million dollars. We only want to put in 500,000, but we will go to other groups and say, uh, gee, we really like this deal. Would you put in 100,000? And, and we can then aggregate the investment and, and syndicate the, uh, the program so that you're coming away with what you need. Uh, so this is the New York Angels website. We're one of the top 10 most active angel groups in the world. Uh, I think I said we've already invested $15 million this year. We've had a very busy year uh, so far and uh, obviously not over yet. We invest in all sorts of companies. We, we like software, but we've recently begun to get into a lot of med, med tech, so medical technology, which frankly we did not do a lot of for many years. That was really owned by Boston. Uh, but now uh, we had a couple of uh, angels join our ranks who are, are really world-renowned doctors uh, and clinicians, and they're giving us insight into investing in, uh, in some of these products and services, which is just great. So here's how it works. Uh, you have your uh, raise that you want to do, so you submit an, act uh, an application. You can go to NewYorkAngels.com. I think you can probably do the same thing at Cherrystone or any of the other angel groups. Uh, that should have a narrative. Uh, here's who we are. Here's what we do. Here's why we're doing it. Here's why we think it'll be successful. Uh, you need to put in financials. You need to put in team profiles. So here's the bad news. Um, we get about 1,200 applications a month. And every month we meet and we review 10 to 12 of those applications. Uh, and we ask those founders to come in and to do a pitch. Uh, and the pitch is 10 minutes in length with five minutes for questions and answers. That's not a lot of time. Uh, so you're doing a fair amount of work without even knowing if you're going to get to come in and meet with us. And so um, that really puts a burden on you to do two things. One is uh, clearly put together the best possible pitch you can, but that kind of goes without saying. But here's the other thing. You really want to be discriminating about who you pitch to, and you want to make sure you're using your time well. So is this a group that invests in the kinds of products that I have? Uh, is this a group that's likely to be amenable to what I'm doing? And you, you really want to do some research in order to do that because it'll, it'll save you a lot of time down the road. Uh, assuming you are selected and you come to a, a, a pitch session, a screening session, uh, at that point, you're not looking for a, uh, an investor yet. You're only looking for interest. So at New York Angels, you need seven investors to raise their hands and say, I want to learn more. I want to know more about this product or service. So let's schedule a discovery session. Uh, and at that point, it's a two hour session. Uh, we'll meet with you. And now those are both uh, in person and virtual, which is great because we can be joined by other investors from all over the country, all over the world. We'll vet your business model. We want to know about your competitors. Uh, we want to know about you, your references. Uh, we will speak to your early clients. Uh, and at that point, if we really like what we hear, we really kind of drop down into due diligence. 
uh, and now we're starting to negotiate terms of your raise. And then that goes forward uh, until it doesn't. That goes forward uh, until we have an agreement uh, that we're going to invest a certain amount of money at a certain valuation, uh, or we decide for whatever reason that uh, your investment is just not for us. Assuming we decide it is for us, now these 7, 10, 12 investors, whatever it is, have decided they want to invest with you. So now maybe at $25,000 uh, per person, you have a couple to a few hundred thousand dollars, what we would call soft circled. So no one has made the investment yet. However, uh, they are leaning towards that investment. Uh, and at that point, we would bring you back into our large group of 150 investors because we've done all the due diligence. We've understood what you, we now understand what you're doing. And we will go back for you and help you make the case to other investors that this is a deal they ought to look at again. So if this all sounds like a lot of work, that's because it is. Uh, and the average, and, and Pat can attest to this, uh, the average investment takes you know three to six months really to shake out. Uh, sometimes folks come to us and they say, we're closing our round in two weeks. We'd love to have you, but you need to let us know by Friday. And 99.999% of the time, the answer is, gee, thanks, but we can't make that, uh, we can't make that schedule. So uh, plan ahead. One of the things entrepreneurs don't do if they've never raised money before is they don't allow enough time for it to happen. It really takes a lot of time. And quite honestly, it's in your best interest to allow enough time because you don't want to be up against the wall needing to accept whatever terms your potential investors are trying to impose on you because you're running out of time and you're running out of money. So you want to you want to be ahead of that curve. Uh, you almost can't begin the process of, of raising money too early. You know, even if it's a year, a year and a half out and you're not ready to raise, you get to meet people, you get to talk to them, you get to learn about the investment process. Uh, and then when you are ready and you come back, you know, it's, it's much more familiar to you. So I want to talk about, you know, how you can win at this because 80 to 85 percent of entrepreneurs who come to see us don't. They don't win. They don't get an investment. And if I can, uh, you know, I think I can use my time here most wisely to try to help you actually win at this game. So pitching is part art, part science, and yes, it's part luck. Who's in the room at the time? So one of the things I'm most excited about the Angel Nest podcast, and, and we've had some really good success. Some of the folks that we've had on the podcast have actually been able to raise money and open doors. And it's because it puts the story down in a format that you can then send to anybody anywhere. It's just an audio file. And People are listening to it in their cars. They're listening to it when they're jogging around the track or whatever they're doing. Uh, and so that precludes a problem that you have when you go to make a live pitch, which is who's in the audience that day? Is the angel that's interested in what you're doing, is he there that day? And if, or is she there that day? And if they are there that day, are they paying attention? Uh, I remember bringing a, a, a fintech company in to the New York Angels one time, and I did it specifically for one investor who I knew would be interested in it. And I gave him a heads up they were coming, and it was all scheduled, and we were all set. And then I went to him after their pitch, and I said, boy, Jeff, I thought that was a great pitch. What did you think? He said, oh, I got called out. I had to take a call. I'm really sorry. <laughs> he missed the whole pitch. So you got to find a way to you know, really stack the odds in your favor and make sure that the right people are hearing what you have to say. And that's kind of why I think our podcast is working, because uh, folks are sending it off as part of their decks, you know, that's and we introduce them to investors, but they're also using it to introduce people that they're going to see to their concept and to their backers and their early investors. So, so here's the key, and, and this isn't just in pitching, this is in almost any sales. You know, um, we all instinctively want to talk about what's important to us, and, and that's totally normal, but it may not get you where you want to go. What's really important is to talk about what your audience wants to know, and that may be very different from what is important to you. So you want to think about if I were an investor in this company, what, what questions would I be asking? So, you know, these are some of the rhetorical and not so rhetorical questions that uh, angels ask. I, I don't know if, uh, if you all are familiar with Shark Tank. Uh, I, bet you, I bet a lot of you probably are, right? So I, I joke that on Shark Tank, the entrepreneurs come in and they do their pitch and everybody beats them up and they're really mean to them. Uh, and tear up their ideas, and then they make a deal. In real angel investing, everybody comes in, and everybody's very nice and kind and generous and complimentary, and then we don't invest. <laughs> so, so you don't always hear or see exactly what everybody is thinking or what they're saying to each other. 
So you've got to really anticipate what it is angels want to know about your business. And that's probably exactly what you would want to know if you were going to make an investment. So, you know, what is the real value of this product or service? What's the value to the marketplace? Not what's the value to you. And it may be important if your company is founded on a personal passion or on something that you needed. And that's okay to tell that story. That's great. It gives you heart and character and people can see you're sincere and where you're coming from. But also tell me why it's valuable to the marketplace. Because as an angel investor, that's the only reason that I'm going to put up money. How big is your addressable market? Uh, you want a very, very big addressable market because a big addressable market can cover up a lot of sins uh, and, can, and can overcome a lot of obstacles. If you have a tiny market uh, and you only have, you know, a, a very low margin of error, you know, folks have come in where the, the market was really five companies. And if you don't get those five companies, you don't have a business. So you want it to be a large addressable market and you want to show investors how you're going to scale this solution. So in your MVP, maybe you've done it, done a great job for 10 companies, but can you actually scale that? Because if you can't scale it, then you can't make any money. Remember, angel investors get paid when you sell the company. They don't get paid along the way for the most part. You can give us dividends. We love that. Never happened to me, but it's great if you want to do it. Uh, most of the time, angel investors get paid when you sell the company. What is your unique selling proposition? And, and is it defensible? First to market's a great strategy, but you got to tell me how you're going to maintain that position when it's out in the marketplace and everybody knows what you're doing. It's the, the, the good part about technology is anybody can do it. The bad part about technology is anybody can do it. The team is most important of all. The expression in our angel group is bet on the jockey, not the horse. So we want to know about you. We want to know about your team. And we want you to give us confidence that you can build this business. Um, I think domain expertise is dramatically underrated. To me, one of the only things that really matters is domain expertise. Do you know the area that you're talking about? Uh, if you've come from that area, my first business, I started uh, in Providence, and I had worked for a guy doing something similar in Boston. So I knew the pitfalls of the business, I knew the nuances, I knew what it was going to take to be successful, and I still struggled. Uh, but folks who come to us and say, I have an idea for a great business that I've never done and don't know anything about this category, they're just all sorts of problems with that. Uh, I remember investing once in a business. Uh, it was a piece of software, and before I invested, I had lined up uh, a large radio station group. So I was not only bringing the investment, I was bringing 400 clients to this company. Can you imagine you know, how anything could possibly go wrong when you're the new investor and you're bringing in 400 clients who's going to make the company instantly profitable. So I made the investment. And then in the orientation session we had with the, with the potential client, they were going through all the benefits. The client loved it. It was great. And then the uh, radio group with the 400 clients said, uh, this software is on your computer, right? How would I access this in the cloud? And, and my CEO said, oh, we don't have a cloud version yet. You'll have to put it on your computer. And, and the potential client said, no, no, they don't allow us to put any outside software on our computer. I'm sorry, we can't do this. And I went from bringing 400 clients to this company to bringing nothing to this company. And that's because I didn't know what I didn't know. And, and, and that's what happens when you get out of your area of domain expertise. So does your team know what they're getting into? Have they ever done it before? They've been in a business before. Uh, very important because first time uh, entrepreneurs, and we've all been there, uh, but you know it, it's very difficult. And so it's helpful to have folks along the way who have had that experience. We can also help with that. So we are mostly former business leaders, uh, former entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs. And, and so those, those are areas where you know our expertise can really be valuable beyond whatever money we can bring to the table. Um, you need to do financials. We want to see what your financial projections look like. We know they're going to change, but we want to see them. Uh, and most important, we want to know that you have thought through this process. Because if you haven't figured out what your financials are, then uh, that's going to be kind of a red flag for us. Hockey sticks. Hockey sticks and investing are uh, financials that look, you know, one year you're going to do $2,000 in business. The next year you're going to do $200,000 in business. And the third year you're going to do $25 million in business. That's a hockey stick, and, and they're not very credible. Um, so if you're going to 
show us the hockey stick and show us how your revenue is going to spike. That's great, but make sure that you can show us how that's actually going to happen. We'll ask you this, why are you raising the money? How will you use the funds? Is it product development? Is it go to market? Is it for salaries? Um, those are all important questions that you want to have answers to. For my angel group, we tend to not fund very much product development unless uh, it is taking the product to the next level. So we want to see that you have a product, that you have tested it on enough clients so that you have minimally viable product or service, and we'll help you with this. We'll help you with this go to market. You need to scale. You need sales help. Uh, maybe you need marketing. You need advertising. Uh, we'll help you with that. Other groups are different. Some folks want to get in. They want to be the very first check in, and they'll help you develop that product. Uh, but that's not us. So uh, if you know you want to kind of figure out where you are and try to target the groups that really relate to what you do, we'll look at the deal from a whole different standpoint. We'll say, is this a good business, and is it a good investment? There are good businesses that are not good investments. How long will it take? Uh, who are you going to sell it to? Remember, angel investors don't get paid until you sell it. We had somebody come in to us a few weeks ago. He said. I'm committed to this idea for the rest of my life, and I want you to help me build this business that I will never sell. And we said, thank you for coming in. Have a nice day. <laughs> We're not interested in backing a business that you're never going to sell because then we will never get paid. Um, is it SaaS or Sushi? What do we mean by that? So SaaS is a great business model because you create the software and then you sell it a million times or two million times or five million times or as many times as you can. Uh, sushi can also be a great business. But it's not a great business for investors because you have to make every piece of sushi. So as investors, unless we really love sushi, uh, angel investors are not going to be too interested in that. Most common mistakes is, uh, you know, frame your pitch for the available time. So we give entrepreneurs 10 minutes and you'd be amazed at how many come in and do their 60 minute pitch and stop after 10 minutes. So you haven't given me the highlights of anything. You've just given me the introduction. So design your pitch to suit the event. Be on time, look sharp. Doesn't mean you have to wear a tuxedo or a suit and tie, but you know, be put together. Uh, remember, uh, it's probably unfair, but all we know about you is what you're gonna say to us in this 10 minutes. And we have to make a decision based on that. So everything counts. Uh, you wanna design your picture on these three basic principles. What's your plan? How does it work? Show me current traction. Show me why I should believe that this is gonna work. And then the particulars of your investment, the raise, what you're gonna use the money for, uh, and what am I buying? That's all driven by valuation. So a lower valuation is more attractive to angel investors than a higher valuation. But of course, you want the highest valuation that you can. Uh, is it an equity round or convertible note? And do you have a lead investor? Um, when you find a lead investor, the world opens up to you because it makes it much easier for other investors to relate. Uh, one of the things that happens on my podcast is the lead investor gets on and talks about how wonderful uh, the company is and folks listen to that because it's kind of third party validation. It's someone other than the founder talking about uh, what a great investment this is. Founder, of course, is most important, but it also helps to have other folks in your corner. Um, so you, you get a term sheet, a lead investor dramatically increases your odds of success. So now here's the trick. I promised you a trick at the beginning uh, and here it is. Do you want to be one of those 100 applications a week? No, you don't. You want to be escorted in. You want to have a path provided for you. You want to know that you're talking to someone who's interested in what you do. And the way that you do that is you find your guardian angel investor. Uh, most of us on our LinkedIn pages or on our uh, pages connected to the website of our angel groups will tell you what we're interested in. I invest in SaaS. I invest in communications companies. I invest in fintech. I invest in sports tech. I invest in marketing. Um, we will tell you what we're interested in, and it pays for you to listen to that, and it pays for you to find the investors who are interested specifically in what you're doing. Because quite honestly, in the very beginning, angel investing is as much about passion for the company and the product than it is about immediate profit, because we all know that immediate profits are not very likely. You know, we're hoping, to, we're hoping that you're going to be a huge success and that you're going to ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange and take us with you. But until then, what's really going to sustain us and what's going to interest us is if you have a product or service that we really feel passionate about, just as you really feel passionate about. So find an angel investor or several angel investors who specialize in what it is you want to do, and then get them to bring you into their groups. That is a much more efficient method than uh, being one of our applicants. 
that um, you know often gets lost in a, in a sea of, uh, of applications. Uh, here's some background on the New York Angels. Uh, who, who will be interested in your company? Find them first and get them involved. So I have, uh, you know, and I, and I probably get 20, 30 pitches a month from companies on LinkedIn. Um, and I try very hard to respond to everybody because I've been in sales all my life and I know what it's like to be ignored. And I, I hate that. So I try to respond to everybody, but I can't. Um, so who do I respond to? I find the folks who are in my area. I find the folks who are doing something that I can bring something to the table or I can judge something. You could you know, be, be uh, creating a new type of atomic energy and I would be fascinated by it, but I'm not your guy because I don't know what you're talking about. So uh, if you find someone in that area, you know, they're going to be a lot more responsive, a lot more interested, and frankly, a lot more helpful to you, which is, which is what this is all about. Angels speak their own language and sometimes only hear each other. And what I mean by that is if you can get an angel to speak for you, if you can get them to introduce you to other angels and to, your, and to their angel groups and to their connections, then you are way, way ahead of the game uh, compared to submitting, uh, you know, blind applications and uh, hoping that you'll be chosen. So that's my, uh, that's my prepared shtick. Uh, would love to hear any questions you have and uh, feel free to speak up. David, so much, so much to talk about here. Um, I've got a ton of questions from people there. I have comments of my own. I'm going to start selfishly on my own, just with a few things you've said. Um, you know, the relevance of the group history as a guy who's pitched many angel groups, a guy who's raised $5 billion. Um, I can tell you, I learned early on, you, you can waste an awful lot of time and energy uh, pitching a group that just doesn't invest in your sector. Right. And those are avoidable mistakes. They're unnecessary burning of calories. You're so right about that. Um, you know, and you talked about the New York Angels discovery session. So you talked about Shark Tank. I'll disagree with you. In the initial pitch, <laughs> everyone is really pleasant to you. And then they say they, they're not going to invest in you. But when you get into that discovery session, the gloves come off. Um, <laughs> it's a pretty I, thorough I going over, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That, 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 that's a, that's a tough one. You, you um, did very, you did very well though, Pat, Pat, Pat navigated our process perfectly. Uh, and, and we got right down to making a significant investment and we just kind of couldn't come to terms, which I always felt badly about, uh, because I would have loved to have uh, been a part of what you're doing there, but you, you did it really very, very well. Thank you, David. So just let's share some of this, some of this experience between us for the rest of the group. You know, one thing I've noticed, um, is that when you're in that room and you're pitching, um, I can look around and I can see 12 people in front of me when I'm pitching and I can find five of them who are looking down at their phone. They've already checked out. Don't worry about the ones who checked out. Worry about the ones who were still staring at you. Make eye contact with them. Uh, see if you can catch on to their track of questions and try to connect with people in the room. You know, so, Pat, I, I, would, I would jump in and disagree with you a little bit. Um, absolutely focus on the people who are looking at you, but the ones looking at their phones have not necessarily checked out. Certainly some of them have, but, you know, we've, we've all learned to multitask. Uh, yeah. And uh, you'd be surprised how many times I would see investors staring at their phones, but then the entrepreneur says something really dynamic and interesting and they look up. So sometimes they're listening. Don't, don't just assume they're not listening. <laughs> fair point. Fair point. Um, and then um, just some of the questions. So let me just start with a softball right off the bat. Um, someone in the audience asked, can we get a copy of your slides? Sure. Okay. So Jenny, Jenny will make sure that she reaches out, gets your slides, and she'll be uh, master of that task. She's wonderful. Um, and I'm going to start off with what probably logically would be the first question, which you partially answered which was how to find the angel groups themselves. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's so many platforms out there. There's Gust. There's all these things. There's so many ways to find them. There's even Google. How would you recommend going about? I know you mentioned having that, that friend angel. I forgot what you called it on the slide. Right. Uh, but the connected angel to walk you in, which is absolutely the best way to go. It's how I got to you. I got brought in by a mutual connection. Right. So, um, and, and at that, an investor, right? So uh, I, I got there using the advice you, you purport, but how do people find angel groups? 
So um, you can obviously get them on LinkedIn, uh, but there is a comprehensive list at the uh, Angel Capital Association, which is ACA, I think it's ACA.org, but I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, Google Angel Capital Association, uh, and they have a comprehensive list of, of their members. Not every angel group is a member of the ACA, but all the serious ones are. So it's a very good place to start. And I'm going to come back to that ACA comment in just a second. Uh, one of the other questions here was, what are the terms that most angels find attractive? Is it equity? Is it convertible debt? Does that really matter to the angel? Or is it is it the price, the deal? Uh, well, it's both. But angels absolutely prefer equity and for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, convertible notes by their very nature uh, are a mystery. We, we don't know exactly what valuation we're investing at. You know, we'd invest at a cap uh, with a discount, um, but we absolutely prefer to be equity investors. We're on your cap table. We're business partners. We're in. Uh, and there are tax reasons too, by the way. So uh, I invested in a company that did very well early on uh, and ended up doubling in a very short period of time but the structure was a note. So I had to pay regular income tax on that. Uh, by the way, I don't get a lot of sympathy for that, which I understand, but um, I had to pay regular tax on that as compared to capital gains tax, or if it qualifies for small business stock, then there is no capital gains tax on the, on the investment. So um, equity, or at, equity, uh, equity or debt matters a lot to investors. And I'm going to say just a couple quick comments here. I know there's a lot of people that are very experienced in raising, and there's some people who are new, and we were all new at some point. So sure. talking about what is equity versus what is convertible debt, these, this, this jargon can be confusing to some new people. I'm going to encourage people on here to reach out to the folks at RIHUB. They have also the Venture Mentoring Service. You can even reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to have a conversation and explain some of this stuff with any entrepreneur out there. Uh, it, it, it can be confusing. Now, one personal note I'll say to everybody, and David probably won't like this as an investor, <laughs> but I found personally that when you have convertible debt, it is the first, last, and only time you really get to control your terms of investment. You issue the note, you issue the cap, you issue all the terms, and people either accept it or they don't accept it. And unless you do a safe, uh, notes tend to be non-negotiable for the most part, everyone goes in at the same price, right? Once you get to your first equity investment, then you have a lead, you negotiate with the lead, and frankly, the lead kind of usually gets a lot of what they want and everyone's investing on the leads terms. That's my personal experience. So safe notes, by the way, are, are very popular in some areas, but they're basically open-ended notes uh, that provide the company with the investor's money for some at some valuation to be determined down the road, at some terms to be determined down the road, at some time, nobody knows when. Uh, sophisticated investors, generally speaking, do not invest in safes. However, uh, I will say that I've had some companies that have been able to, to raise money on a safe note. And if you can do it, uh, you know, more power to you. All right. Well, the questions keep pouring in. There's a ton of them. I want to just take another minute. I want to ask a personal question that I found very useful. Um, this actually came out a piece of advice from a mutual friend of ours, Victor Alice of the Beacon Angels. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense to, when we talk about angels, I think, to break them into three groups. You have the individual angel investor, right? Sometimes that's your very first money. Someone gives you a $25,000 check, I believe in you, right? Then there's actually, in my experience, there's two types of groups, uh, one is the type of group where you pitch the group and then they pass the hat and everyone's either in or out. And there are other groups that invest as funds, which are kind of important because in my experience, when you get the pass the hat group, again, you don't worry about the guy or gal looking at his or her phone because they're not going to invest anyway. You just focus on the ones who are paying attention with you. And like David said, there are people multitasking, but you get to a point where you get the message. Um, and in that, you know, you can have 15 people in the room and you only need four of them to say, I'll put in money, right? And they're going to write their own checks. Whereas in the fund, you get a little bit of a differing um, argument where you have 
everyone's money's in the same pot and you need a certain percentage of the people in that angel group to say yay. And then the person who's looking at their phone isn't as dangerous as the person in the room who doesn't like what you're doing and is going to behind closed doors lobby hard against investing in you. So do you have any commentary on the differing strategies going for the individual versus the pass the hat versus the fund? So at New York Angels, um, we have actually now begun to use our funds as ride-along vehicles. So a couple of different ways it works. You know, one is what you're describing, Pat, where the fund makes an investment decision separate and apart from the individual investors. And, and we found that to be pretty cumbersome. So we actually now have uh, a fund that will invest in a company so long as it achieves a certain milestone. Uh, and I don't remember exactly what the criteria is, but it's, you know, many investors and several hundred thousands of dollars. And then the fund will kick in and um, will invest alongside the, uh, the individual angels. So at least it, in my group, there's really no differentiation between the, the fund pitch and, and the individual angel pitch. But, you know, certainly if, if you have the ability to get a pot of money, uh, and you can target, you know, you can often find out who is running the fund uh, and, and make individual pitches to them. Obviously, they would need to bring a lot of other angels along. But that's, again, a function of, uh, you know, finding your guardian angel, targeting the right one so that, you know, they then can, can bring others into the mix. We have so many questions here and they just keep stacking up. But they're really good questions. You mentioned that, was it 1,200 pitches a month? New York Angels gets and 1200 applications. Uh, right. How do you get past the screener? Is it just a great deck? What's, what's your, what's your best advice? Um, a great deck is, is essential, uh, but, but maybe not, uh, maybe not adequate in some cases. Um, so in, in New York Angels, the members actually review the applications. So, um, you know, that's a case of I'm in the communications area, so they would send me the companies that have to do with communications. Um, and, and, you know, then it's just it's making the best case you can uh, in a very short period of time, because, you know, when you come into pitch, you get 10 minutes. If I'm going through your deck and I have 15 decks to go through, you may get considerably less than 10 minutes. So it's 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 a big idea and and showing some traction. I, I would say that. Um, the investments that get looked at first are the ones that have some traction. So if you have, if you have some industry investors, by the way, if you have someone, you know, what we would call smart money, someone in your industry that's backing you, that's saying this will work, uh, or if you have early traction with customers, put that up front. Excellent. So just, I'm going to keep going with these, David. There, I've tried to front load some of the obvious early questions to the front, but now it's going to get a little all over the place. Okay. So on the basis of non-dilutive funding, do angel investors ever entertain the idea of a rev share model with entrepreneurs? And I know we see that on Shark Tank all the time with Mr. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, but is this something that really happens in the real world? Um, I saw it proposed only once and it, it didn't happen. Um, I would say that it would be highly unlikely that would happen with a group. However, it could happen with individual angels. You know, if you need $100,000 or $200,000 as opposed to $2 million, and you can find an individual angel or a couple of angels who are interested in doing that, uh, you know, that, that, that may be feasible. Never really seen it happen with a large group. It just, it, it gets so messy because, you know, there's the monitoring and the reporting and, and, uh, even worse would be a profit sharing because, you know, the definition of profit also lands at the CEO's desk. So, so uh, another question here, um, and this one's a little broad, I'm going to add my own twist to it. So the question was, what are the terms that most angels will find attractive when offered a convertible note? And I'm going to temper that with, is it really the terms or is it the terms relevant to traction and the opportunity size? Um, so yes, absolutely to both. Uh, but you can sweeten a convertible note with terms, uh, especially if you have something that's going to convert to preferred equity, right? Um, and you provide a dividend. So you can offer a 4%, 5%, 6% dividend 
you're not going to pay out money in cash, but that's going to allow the investor to earn more equity during the time that this note is is happening. And typical note, uh, typical note time is two years duration. Typical note duration is a couple of years. You can do longer, but you know. So if you come to me and you say, you know, I really, uh, I really need to do a note for a lot of reasons, and sometimes. Companies want to do a note just because it's a lot less expensive than it is to do a priced round where you there are a lot of legal fees. And, you know, clearly we understand that. And, and we're on, you know, we're on the side of the company. If we're investing in you, we don't want we don't want you to spend any more than you have to on legal fees. So those are the ways that you can that you can sweeten the pot a little bit by providing a dividend of some sort. Uh, and so if we know, you know, what we're going to be converting into the problem with the safe is uh, it's it's not very safe for investors because it could be anything by the time it actually comes to fruition. And going back, I knew I was going to come back to it, going back to your American uh, Venture Capital Association comment, um, one of the great things to remember for everyone out there, David talked about how convertible debt is cheaper. It is significantly cheaper for, I mean, really cheap for an investor. It's, it's almost do it yourself in some cases because the American Venture Capital Association puts out guidelines for standard convertible debt wording. Uh, and in even early rounds, they have guidelines on what is basic uh, AVCA wording for most of this stuff. So it's a great resource. And if your stuff follows their guidelines, it makes it very acceptable to most angel groups. The more you vary from it, the more it scratches heads, I would say. Uh, I will also say that some groups have their own templates that they use. So we have a uh, term sheet for both a convertible note and for priced equity round. And very often during that last phase that I told you about, so you have five, six, seven, eight, ten investors, whatever it is. Now you're coming back before the whole group. And these five, six, seven, eight investors, they want as many people to invest as possible because we want it to be successful. And one of the arguments they will use with the rest of our membership is, hey, this is a New York Angels term sheet. So let's invest in this. We know that it's it, it represents something that, that we're happy with. So I'm going to just go ahead. I know Andre Gonzalez had a question that you've already answered. He said, is New York Angels interested in fiber ISP companies? Do you invest in telecommunications? So Andre, I'm going to tell you, just go ahead and reach out to David on the on LinkedIn, because he's already said he's the man for that. Um, let's see. I'm going through some other questions here. By the way, so, anybody, any, uh, while you're doing that, I'll just say uh, anyone who wants to reach me anytime, my email is david at the angel nest dot com the angel nest dot com and if i don't respond to your email it's not because i'm insincere it's because i get overwhelmed you can call me anytime i'm, I'm one of those people that actually prefers a phone call and my number is 212-831-1559 guys you're never going to get that from an angel investor ever again and david <laughs> i have to tell you i'm watching the video of everyone everyone's head just went down really quick <laughs> you said that <laughs> um, so just some other questions. I am literally just reading them here because we've got t uh, 10 minutes and I need two minutes to wrap at the end. So sure. uh, we still have, it looks like 10 plus questions. So I'm going to do my best. So a convertible note with a QSBS clause will be easier to accept? Um, sure. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. I had a question. I know, uh, I think it's relevant. It wasn't asked here, but I'm going to bring it up especially since we have a lot of uh, social impact ventures in Rhode Island, uh, which is, what is your feeling about B Corps as, in, as uh, being investable? Um, I think that there is an audience uh, for B Corps, and certainly with, within the angel community, there are folks who um, very much uh, want to invest in B Corps. Uh, I'm not sure that it's where you're going to find critical mass. Remember, if you're going to get an investment from an angel group, you know, you need four, five, six investors. Uh, I, I, I feel like, um, I, I mean, I can just tell you that we've never really had one on that basis. Uh, I think we had a, we had a B Corp uh, investment, but it was really, you know, based on the domain expertise of, of the angel who brought it in. I mean, they were kind of investing before they brought it in, and I don't think anybody else invested. So I, I, I'm not sure that an angel group is the place that you're going to achieve that. Okay. And actually, as I go through all of these questions, so many of them are, are going into the minutia of safes. And those it's, a, it's, a, it's a debate, Pat. I don't know if you want to go into a lot of it. I'm not going to go that deep into it, but thanks, Adam. Um, 
Adam, Adam, of course, um, has raised money on a save. So congratulations. Um, there's a there's a, a, a an active discussion around the uh, the values of the of that. Um, I, I will. Yeah, I can't I can't tell you whether it's right or wrong. I can only tell you what the perception is in my community. I can tell you the best piece of advice an angel investor ever gave me when it came to whether it was a B Corp or safe or something. Don't make it hard for me. Just don't make this hard for me. Make take as many questions out of this as you can. Let me focus on the decision around the business and not other things. I think um, that's right. Yeah, simple does better in all cases here. So, um, and I want to do also. I wanted to ask you a little bit about to syndicate or not to syndicate because you know there's all kinds of funny stuff that happens with this. Um, I had. As you know, David, I actually had, I, I've had a couple of horror stories, but I had a terrible horror story with an angel group in Florida before you guys who basically said, we're going to take your whole round. And then they're going to, uh, then they said, don't pitch anybody else. We're taking your whole round. And then oh. they dragged their feet and they dragged their feet and they ran me into the ground. Then they changed their terms and they walked away and left me almost bankrupt, uh, which you will remember that we won't, we won't name the group. I, I'm not a big fan of South Florida angel groups anymore. <laughs> but um, I'm not alone on that, by the way. Is that um, right? But and then we had another one where um, I worked with you. We had a great relationship. I did. I went long and deep with with the New York Angels. It's such a fantastic org. You guys decided eventually. It was so close, right down to the wire. But you didn't invest in me. But the group you bought in to syndicate <laughs> uh, looked. They were going to be your partner in this uh, up in Boston. Uh, looked at everything and they said, well, if they're not coming in, we're just going to lead. And they took it over and they ran with it and they invested. And I have one of their members on my board. So there's. So it worked out. It worked out. So where <laughs> am I going with this? I mean, if I look back at my own personal experience, I personally like syndication a lot. And I try really hard to get people to syndicate as much as possible. Because it not only if I'm that first angel group in Florida, if I had somebody else involved with it, A, they couldn't have just dragged their feet. The other partner might have pushed them to move or, or move aside. And if even if one steps out, the other one can keep going. There's the other side of that coin where sometimes, especially if you have sidecar type groups, where um, – if one group backs out, the other one will walk away. They don't want to lead. They don't want to be there on their own. And I think there's also a, a decent conversation around finding an angel willing to lead as opposed to finding people who ride along or sidecar. And, and maybe you could talk a little bit about what a lead investor means uh, in terms of driving the terms and then driving the syndication. So lead investors are critical, uh, not only because they help you pull the round together, but also because uh, if, you, if you're gonna end up with an investor on your board, and sooner or later you probably are, uh, you know, that's kind of your chance to pick who's gonna be on your board. Um, so your lead investor very often, you know, will kind of end up being your partner and, and really, you know, trying to pull the whole round together. In terms of syndication, you know, and, and this is true in any sales effort, you just should talk to anybody who will talk to you for as long as they will talk to you, uh, and when someone says, you know, uh, please don't talk to anybody else, you know, uh, and, and by the way, Pat, I've done the same thing, so I totally get it. But, you know, you just have to say, I, I, I would love to give you the whole round. If, as soon as you sign for it, it's yours. But until then, I've got to keep, you know, uh, shaking other trees because I've got a you know, responsibility here to get this done. Um, one of the things that I learned is, you know, there are just angel groups at all levels of knowledge, sophistication, integrity, like, like everything else, I guess. Um, and, you know, the, the story that you, that you had about what happened to you is just appalling. I mean, it's just against everything that an angel investor should, should do and, and want to stand for. But, you know, it's, it's as different as all the people that make up the groups, unfortunately. And so that makes it very hard to predict. You know, David, it's a podcast episode. Biggest horror <laughs> stories in angel investing, right? <laughs> that, that could, there could be a couple of sequels to that one, too, probably. So we're getting really to the end here. I, I, I want to just add one other question. I know there's some other questions in the chat. We're just not going to get to everything. Um, I had a comment one time by an angel investor uh, in Boston, of all places, just stuns me, who said, yeah, you know, we'd, we'd like to invest, but um, 
I'm going to make this two questions because I think they're both really relevant points. We'd like to invest, but you're just a little too far away. And I can't see myself coming down to Providence once a quarter for a board meeting, you know, because they, as a lead, they'd want a board seat. Like Boston, the Providence is such a big deal. So um, do you agree that proximity plays a role? And then I do have one other follow-up question. So I would say that until, until COVID, uh, Proximity played a, a, a role, maybe maybe to eighty percent. It was critical, absolutely critical. I mean, I, I knew I knew hundreds of angel investors who wouldn't invest in something they couldn't drive to, let alone fly to. Uh, but I would say that that is becoming very much passe, and if it's not totally passe, it will be very quickly, as we now look at deals all over the world. Uh, and and frankly, it's it's a better situation for everybody because more companies are getting funded, we're getting more opportunities. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, Annette, I see you raising your hand. Annette uh, from Ryhub, the managing director, your question? Yeah, I, I don't have a question. I want to make a comment to all of the entrepreneurs here. So there's a great reason to start early. And there's, I love that David said it, it's never too early. You want to build a relationship first and foremost. And I've never been to a pitch meeting that I didn't learn something. I might not like what I learned, but I learned something. Most important, if you can find people with money that is more than just green, in other words, it's not just money in your bank that you're gonna use, but they're gonna bring you a network. They're gonna have a connection. They're gonna have know-how that you're not getting somewhere else. That is the value. Again, I get it. We've all been there. You'll probably be there too someday um, where you get desperate. And you're like, I can't even you know, make, you know, make payroll. That's one thing. But the, the reason why you want that length of time, that runway, is you want to be able to get people in your deal that are going to mean something more than just bank bank account. Sorry. So I wanted to say. Can I, can I, just, can I just say 10 seconds on that? Um, Go for it. So there's a thing called the selling cycle, and you cannot defeat the selling cycle. You could have the most incredible thing in the entire world. But I need a certain amount of time to get to know you, to understand what you're doing, to understand the product, to know that I can trust you. There's just that just takes a certain period of time. It's like buying a car, right? You didn't wake up whatever you whatever the latest car you bought is. You didn't wake up one morning and decide to buy it, right? It was a it was a process. You found you heard about somebody who had it. You heard it was a pretty good car. You went and looked at it. You decided on the color. You know the guy who tried to sell you that car on the first day wouldn't have been successful. So there's so many questions. I know people are asking about, can we use FOMO with investors? How long would you like to see a company operate before they sell? I'm just not going to get to all these wonderful questions. Um, I know I will tell you my best piece of advice from all the fundraising work I've ever done. And that is to learn that whoever leads needs to have a strong network and a great reputation because uh, your lead investor Aside from their money, their greatest value is their ability to bring others along. So finding a group like the New York Angels with a stellar reputation, they, they are the type of angel group that you want to have lead. Um, David, take a minute. Pitch the Angels Nest. Um, so uh, this is the, the greatest venture I've ever done that started by accident. We were, uh, we were trying to fund a company in Scotland, and nobody was going to Scotland. So we put together the, the Angels Nest 10-minute um, podcast talking not only about what the founder was doing, and he was doing an amazing job of creating fast Asian casual dining at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, one case where sushi, sushi actually did make sense because he wanted to uh, expand to other markets. Uh, and we put together a podcast and investors responded because they heard his first investor get on and really make the case. Um, so we've uh, done a bunch since then. Uh, I'm looking for great stories. I enjoy doing it. Uh, it's been a tremendous amount of fun. And uh, I, I, I invite you to go take a listen at theangelsnest.com and uh, hope to uh, meet you on the air one of these days. David. We're going to have David back, I hope. We want to build a relationship with him in Rye Hub and the state of Rhode Island. So thank you. And, it's, my, David, it's my pleasure. I, I'm happy to help any way I can. As I said at the start of the session, Always a pleasure to talk with David. So informative, so open, so kind, so amazing. Thank you. And, you know, COVID has been far too long. I can't wait for the next time you're up in Rhode Island or I'm down in New York and to sit down and just have another pleasurable conversation with you over coffee. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with all of us. 
My pleasure. Thank you all for listening, and and I hope to uh, speak with you all again. Hey, everyone, this has been the Angel's Nest. Uh, uh, in my opinion, the greatest session we've had this year for me personally. I love this.